Okay, everyone, welcome again to the Love Fruit podcast. We've got another legendary guest today, someone who's uh, well known in the vegan, the online vegan, raw vegan, fruit uh, loving community around the world. Controversial character to some, hero to others, villain in other people's eyes, uh, <laughs> someone that's always been the you know, the pain in the neck of the whole paleo carnivore movement as that evolves. Um, Harley Johnstone, also known as Durian Rider. Um, and I'll, I'll, I, and I probably said this to you, Harley, like you were one of my first mentors getting, on, getting into this um, many years ago. And, and I'd be interested to talk about this because when I started to get into even just veganism and, and I pretty much got into vegan and the whole raw food fruitarian thing about the same time. And it seemed at that time that when I look back, like who I was finding on YouTube at that time when I was looking for just even vegan information was guys like you, Tim Van Orden, uh, Michael Arnstein. Like it seemed like I was just finding all these kind of people that were into the raw thing as well or into the fruit thing at the same time. Um, and at that time, I don't even remember that many vegan YouTubers that I was coming across that weren't like inspired by you or like were somehow involved in raw food as well. What was your kind of memory of that time and and you kind of blowing up on YouTube and everything? Yeah, I remember just thinking, uh, you know, I had a, in two thousand six. First of all, thanks for having me on, Ronnie. Appreciate yeah. the uh, appreciate your time. Love these uh, podcasts and videos. Ask me any questions you want. Nothing's too controversial person or whatever, ask me anything. But yeah, 2006, I was in Thailand and a friend of mine, Kelly, she was like, Harley, you've you got to get into this YouTube thing. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, YouTube, like, what is that? And she, she went to show me. We are in this internet cafe and we just had this durian meal. It was late at night and she was there in the bikini top and stuff and uh, she's, she's showing me you know, YouTube and she went to click on it and it was banned in Thailand because someone uploaded a YouTube video against the Thai uh, government etc the monarchy and so Thailand shut down YouTube yeah. and I was just thinking oh, how good is YouTube it's not even in Thailand I, I just sort of brushed off and Kelly's like no no Harley you got you got to do this you got to do this and I'm like eh and I just didn't really understand what she was trying to tell me you know but yeah. I, I appreciate that she was believed in me and wanted me to use a great platform and then and in 2008 um, I got onto the YouTube platform and when I finally worked out how to upload a video I mean Freely was also saying you know get onto YouTube uh, you, should, you, should, you do great at that. And then 2008 went from there. But it was, uh, I didn't really understand the power of YouTube back then. I didn't yeah. understand the power of social media like I do today. So Right, right, right. Pioneer of the, the vegan YouTube community. Some people will say because I was the person first out there really cranking up the videos, the what I eat in a day videos and the, the vlogs and helping people understand, you know, eating yeah. fruit and carbohydrates and riding bikes and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and the thing that I've the thing that I saw Harley that like I, I guess I've not spoken a lot about this kind of thing, but what I remember, uh, and I don't know why I want to get into this, but I just thought it just came onto my mind. Like I remember, Anything. yeah, I, I remember going to Woodstock maybe the second time I went, and and you were there. I think Freely was there as well, two thousand and fourteen mm. maybe, or it might be thirteen. No, it would have been thirteen. Thirteen, yeah. And I just remember the amount of people thinking back that were there. I felt there was people there to try and build a YouTube channel and they were interviewing you, following you around, following freely around. They did multiple videos with you, built their channel based on the back of that, as far as I could see. And then a couple of years later, they all turned, a lot of those people turned on you. And I just <laughs> thought, I just saw that happen. And I'm like, how could they all do that? Like, I mean, and, and, and uh, like, I can see it from everyone's perspective, but for me, I just thought, even if you don't like the guy, you've got to at least admit that you used his following and everything to build, to start off, yeah. you know? So I saw that and I didn't really, well, how did that feel? I guess that wasn't very, you know. Uh, that, that's just human nature, you know. You, you, sure. I, I mean, I sort of brought that upon myself. You know, I was making, making so much money and just flashing it, you know. And so when you do that, you're attracting people who want quick, easy money, who aren't really genuine. They just genuinely want money and they want it quick and want it now. So they'll do anything for the cash. And uh, so I attracted an army of those sort of people around who didn't really care about the movement, didn't care about other people, just wanted money, quick, easy money. 
And so when they got an opportunity to try and throw me under the bus, they all rallied up. And back in 2017, it was, they all conspired together to upload a series of wire cut tires and videos in 2017 to uh, try and push me down. And all it did was just you know, push apart the community and just expose who was, who's only there for the money. That's so right. It was, they're, they're not passionate people. And, Passionate about money, that's about it. What I we got, create is if, if we took out all the money and then we'd see who's left. Yeah, and it's, 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 that's kind of ironic because I think one of the things that I remember first getting into your videos and stuff and, and also meeting you at Woodstock and all that thing, or all that kind of thing was that it did seem like you didn't have an agenda that was anything connected to money. I know you wanted to get the message out there and, and you know, you, I guess you're making money on YouTube or whatever, but it seemed like you were basically the one of the things people liked about you was you were kind of exposing the fact that the raw vegan thing and, and maybe even veganism was was being used for selling products that people didn't really need you know all yeah, these different, yeah these different supplements and powders and protein powders whatever it was um how did that but I, i'm guessing that from your background like how did you get into all this in terms of veganism, raw food and, and all that. I'm guessing at some point you might have even bought some of those things yourself or maybe, you know, everyone goes through a stage of learning, I guess. But yeah. let's go back. How did you get in, into even changing your diet to veganism, vegan diet? Like, um, where did that all yeah. well, I've always been into health and performance. I was always a sick kid in school. My mum had a lot of health food books on her uh, bookshelf. She had a book by Leslie Kenton called Raw Energy. I remember flicking through that back in 1986, maybe, just flicking That's through. Just my, my mom had that book as well. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> so how, how are you, Ronnie? I'm 30, 35, 34. Okay, 35. Yeah. I'm 40, 43 in a couple of months. So yeah, we're similar sort of generation. Um, yeah, so mum had mom had that book on a bookshelf and my mum was into health, using the weight loss, like most women sure, are. Sure, sure. And so I was exposed to it, but at a, you know, sort of a low level. And then when I started getting more health issues as a cyclist trying to, you know, increase my performance, we're getting a lot of asthma and fatigue and, and just get, feel a frustration. I started, you know, looking more to my nutrition and met this guy who told me to go vegetarian. And so I went vegetarian for a week and instantly felt better on my lungs and my performance. My VO2 max went up. I could just feel that. And then uh, for, okay, so why am I still having dairy? And then I thought, well, I'll just, uh, flick off the dairy. Dairy's a pretty cool industry. I don't need it. And then I yeah, stopped having dairy and the next day I felt even better, you know, mm. with the breathing. I was like, okay, there's something, you know, and I felt so good. I was just living on pure carbs back then, rice, sugar, fruit. And I just felt so, you know, angelic on the bike. I just felt like, oh my God, like, well, I've been lying to you for so long. Yeah. And uh, this is back before social media was around. You in a shop? Yeah. Yeah, I see it. And uh, yeah, I was just like, yeah, cranking. Then I got into Raw Food in 2002. I found a book called Raw Life by Paul Nisson. And I got that book and uh, read that book. And it made a lot of sense as well because Paul put a lot of good arguments out there that you know, cooked food is not so good. And and it was great. But then And then in that book, there was a lot of you know space cadets talking about breath air and stuff like that. And I was like, come on, this is, you know, and I got to, as an athlete, you understand that breath air and such is just nonsense. But I can understand that some of these narcissist sociopaths are really good at talking and communicating really well. So if you're into fairy tales and stories, then you start to believe it in what they're saying is true if you don't understand human physiology. And then in that book was Doug Graham. And Doug Graham, you know, he stood out by far being you know, into sport. And I, and I really gravitated towards Doug because, you know, he was also an athlete. And what he was saying just made sense. You know, get your carbs in, carbs, carbs, carbs. And I'm like, well, that's what I'm doing now, but with fruit, okay. And I, so I tried that and also felt better. The only issue was always being able to find, you know, good quality fruit where you get enough calories. So, For sure. And, and Doug back then, was so Doug, you know, credit where credit's due, Doug is a huge inspiration for increased fruit intake. And uh, at that time, I'd read the book called Fit for Life by Harvey Diamond. Yeah, and so yeah. I learned about fruit for breakfast, fruit for lunch, and then starches for dinner. So essentially raw till four. And so I was doing that, and that was, that was, you know, what I've come come back to. But the fruit thing, I think 100% fruit appealed to me as like a, back in my 20s, back in the day there, you know, as a bit of a challenge of like, you know, a bit of a rebellion sure. against society, cooked foods, poison, it's, you know, it's the establishment and all this. And, 
and it's partly true. And uh, so, yeah, I had some challenges there, but it was, it was great. It was a really good time. And I went to see Doug Graham at his uh, Health and Fitness Week 2006. <clears throat> Met Christina there, Fully Well Christina, helped her get her YouTube channel going. Met a guy called Robbie Barbaro. Yep. And uh, yeah, did some, did, uh, had, some, had a great experience and uh, had some really, really good times uh, at Doug's events. And uh, we mentioned I had been falling out of the money and stuff like that and social media. That's <laughs> we quite, stopped going. Yeah, that's, but, uh, yeah. that's quite a yeah. little group. If you think about that, that's quite a little group there. Fully Rock, Christina, yourself, Robbie, all of you, I guess, weren't really doing much at that point online and all of you, like, I mean, Robbie recently is coming out with this book, seems to be that's blowing up. And yeah. uh, pretty amazing. So Doug really did have quite a, a pretty good influence. I don't know exactly what he was doing at those events or how he, if he, if he inspired you guys in any way, but that's kind of, kind of interesting. Yeah, it was, it, I guess Doug is also most of the time a very sh straight shooter and he's just, he tells you what you need to hear. hear. And so I, I just love when people don't bullshit when it comes to nutrition, just tell you straight up. There were some things I disagree with Doug. He had a book called Grain Damage, and he was saying that you know, carbs make you, you know, rice makes you overweight. I'm like, well, you know, I'm in the fire. It's not, it's not the case. But otherwise, the fruit thing does make sense for sure. And uh, it, it was great. Good times. Good times. I wish, though, that I wasn't trying to be 100% raw. I, I put 100% raw as this, like, goal. And then so we're like, okay, you know, eat he, he heaps of nuts and stuff like that. And, we all know what it feels like to eat to be nuts. Right, right. And so, yeah, I should have just focused on my performance. Right. And versus focusing on this idealization of 100% raw, which doesn't increase your performance at all. In, in actual fact, I find eating 100% raw, you know, I, I cannot perform as good as I can on you know, raw till four or adding in some refined sugar to my fruit smoothies, et cetera, just for that right. glycogen restoration. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm still a huge fruit eater and I'm, I'm a fruit junkie, you know, I, mean, I travel to places just for the fruit quality. Sure, so, yeah. sure, sure. So before you got into like that side, like the 10 10 thing and everything, were you trying raw in, a, in another way? Were you ever trying like uh, the superfoods and all that kind of oh, stuff? Yeah. Or? yeah. I mean, back in back in the day, David Wolf, David Wolf is a mad, mad char uh, charismatic narcissist dude, one of the best storytellers ever a huge inspiration for a lot of people, including myself back then. He was just, he's just, this that dude is like finesse on feet. Like he's just, <laughs> he is a smooth salesman there. And he's a funny dude. And I hung out with him a few times in uh, California there at the, uh, you know, at these raw fruit expos and health food expos and just watched how he worked. And uh, you went out yeah, there, David, you, you went out in California, yeah? Yeah, I was in California. I cycled from uh, Cedro Woolley in Washington down to Escondido in, in Southern California there, my, my Trek OCLV US postal bike, of camping out and just sleeping on the, in the, on the side of the road and meeting fellow vegans and stuff and camping with them. Nice. And it was a great time. It was three months from uh, September 2006 to October, November 2006. And so, yeah, Dave Wolf, I used to listen to Dave Wolf all the time on his podcasts and stuff and a little one gig MP3 player and I'd play it again and again. And Dave Wolf, he, uh, he has, he's a great speaker. Yeah. And he, he sort of incorporates a bit of Tony Robbins, positive mental attitude and, and uh, stuff like that. So I was very inspired by that. And um, Dave Wolf obviously sold out big time to the, the almighty dollar and started peddling some little dodgy stuff. And <laughs> there was lots of, uh, you know, crazy stories that came out of Dave Wolf. Uh, Dave Wolf's seen his friends getting busted for ecstasy dealing at JFK airport. And, but yeah, just, just, uh, you yeah. know, to take the good out of it, to give credit where credit is due, Dave Wolf, uh, he was a great speaker, a great presenter, you know, apart from some dodgy behaviours, otherwise, you know, put out some positive content. But again, he, then Dave Wolf was talking about how dates are bad and sugar's bad and fruit's bad. And right, I'm like, okay, right, like, right. You're just saying that to push your cacao agenda. And right. but I bought a few of Dave. I think everybody bought chocolate from Dave Wolf back then. <laughs> you know, Dave Wolf could sell chocolate to, to anyone. You know, he could sell yeah. chocolate to caribou. Yeah, he was uh, he was a master salesman. But yeah, yeah. after having cacao, the next day having that fatigue, the adrenal exhaustion, you know, it's just like you're like, this isn't health food. This is a drug. <laughs> this is a definitely strong drug. Yeah, but that's uh, I mean that's that's interesting. I mean, I, I guess one of the things that kind of got your YouTube channel going maybe was the fact that you were calling out these different characters in the raw food 
seen. I think yeah. am I right? Am I right in thinking one? In fact, one of the first videos for you that went viral was about a Joris Wonder Planets or something like that. Is oh that yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. I did a, I did a video as well. Um, why is Dave Wolf overweight? And that got a lot of traction. Yeah, that's the and, one. That, that's how I found you. Was that that video? Yeah, that, that was an interesting one. And I was like, wow, why are people so worried about if people are fat? Because you know, people would ask me, why is Dave Wolf overweight? And I'm like, oh, he just eats a lot of fat. You know, <laughs> a lot of fat. And so I wasn't really trying to be a diss. At that point, though, what Dave Wolf was doing by dissing fruit, dissing carbohydrates, I'm like, well, I, I got quite irritated by that because right. if you're dissing carbohydrates, then people aren't going to f- succeed in a vegan lifestyle. You know, they'll buy your product, but they'll be like, oh, no, I tried vegan, spent a lot of money, but made me feel like junk. Sure. And so anyone who's knocking carbs, even though I looked up to them or haven't been inspired by them in the past, Dave Wolf or Doug, when I, you know, when I hear them knocking carbohydrates, I was just be like, come on, man, like, this is nonsense. What are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? And yeah, Arjun is wonder planets. That, you know, that dude was a total fruitcake, ended up dying from a heart attack in Thailand. Then fell, he was on working on a roof, had a heart attack, fell off, and and, and and passed away. So he was he was a great another great storyteller as well. But uh, yeah, Aginus Thunder Planet's not even his real name. But uh, no one knows what his real name was. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of people in the whole natu- whatever alternative health world have had you know different names and <laughs> made up names and stuff. It seems um, you mentioned the. Uh, we mentioned briefly breath, breatharianism and something. That's another thing that I only, I think I really only came across that because you would speak about it back in the day, and I'm kind of surprised that that still gets a lot of attention. There's still a lot of people that want to believe that, and it really concerns me. It really concerns me that people still want to that want that to be real, and and now it's called like pranic living or something like that. Um, oh. Have you have you seen? Do you, do you still see people as well that ask you about that or? Um, I think I'm probably known in that circle to, <laughs> I'm totally you know, against it. But yeah, what you, it attracts the same fruit cakes that they hide their real name. A lot of them, you know, it's like I use an alias. I use an alias during everyone knows me. I'm Harley Johnston. It's no hard than that. But yeah, it seems to attract these people from shady pasts mm. and, uh, you know, it, it's just quick money. It's quick money. If you're promoting something that's going to attract some people with some mental health issues, breatharianism, you know, like to believe that you can live without food is an ultimate fairy tale. But to really, to really just want to do that, in my opinion, that's some mental health going on right there. Or it will cause mental health because you'll starve your brain of glucose and then you start to go into this like la la land where you never had any schizophrenic, um, you know, behavior before but you'll you'll develop that you put anyone on breath organism and they will become schizophrenic because your brain just goes into like la la land and i think it's because the body nature is very kind to us in that when you're starved it's almost pleasurable it's almost pleasurable like i've done fasting out in in the forest by myself and it's you're in this like almost semi ecstasy semi like drug stuff it's pleasurable Ah, for, ah, pa- once you get past the you know, the cravings, the body's like, give me some food. When it knows the food's not coming, you're sort of like, you know, in and out of like hunger and just ecstasy. And so that can be confused as health. Yeah, It's really just your cortisol and your endorphins just making your death peaceful. You know, it's making, okay, you've got no food. We're just going to let you check out, check off the planet. Same with adrenaline. Like if, if a tiger gets you, it doesn't hurt because you've got so much adrenaline in your body you don't feel it. You don't feel the teeth going into your neck. That's really, yeah, that's really interesting because I feel like there's a lot of people that are chasing that high, either, you know, constantly doing fasting. I I think that I get the feeling that dry fasting probably gives people a high like that, some kind of, and and as you're saying, probably from adrenaline or the body just freaking out and saying like, go out and (laughs) get something to eat. Like what are you doing, you know? It it is hundred percent. And you you get that in the bicycle. I learned that early. Um, before you run out of glycogen, muscle glycogen, you get this spike of adrenaline. You get, you feel like God. You feel like oh, you're just destroying it on the bike. You just oh, you smash it through walls right before you bonk. Oh, so wow. if you time that perfectly, you know, like one or two k's before the finish, you have this surge and you'll win the sprint or smash the climb. But if you don't time it right, you get the surge and then bang, 
right. using ketosis and you're out the door. And I've seen this in the Tour de France. I've seen it, you know, many, many times where the rider will have this like, you know, super manic, Superman feeling and then just <clears throat> totally blow up. We saw it recently with this um, famous runner, Joseph Chepta guy. He's a mm -hmm. Ugandan. He set the world record recently for five and 10 K road. And in the 2017 world champs, he just attacks in the running races, cross country, about 34 minute run. And he, he just breaks away from the pack. And what, that, was, that was his surge. But he timed it bad. And then he ran out of carbs, went into ketosis and finished like two minutes back. And got passed by everyone. Right. You know, so that was a perfect example. So, but he would have felt like total Superman during that. And so right. the average punch out there who gets that Superman surge goes, wow, this is health. This is, right. and then they keep chasing that. But it's, it's just a drama. You know, it's that's just a, behind that, them kicking in. That's amazing. That is absolute. Like, because I've always thought about that. Like, why are people getting these, why are people so attracted to these states and feeling these highs and, you know, and that's, and, and you know, that classic thing of people saying, the less I eat, the better I feel. Sometimes people say stuff like that. Totally makes sense from what you're saying. Yeah. You know, it, um, you'll, you'll feel better for a little bit, but your performance will eventually suck and your mood will suck. And you'll be like, an hour later, two hours later, you'll be all emotional and crying. And then you'll right. just detox the emotions from when I was a kid and I got abused. And so now you're just really hungry and your adrenaline and cortisol is all over the shop. Yeah. Your so thyroid's that, taking a beating. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's, that's the advantage of you being a, an athlete. The same with Doug Graham, the, the advantage of that athletic background, understanding a bit more the performance of the body. Same with Michael Arnstein as well, talking about that uh, with him earlier on. And the, just the idea that like, um, you kind of probably know your body because you can track your performance level, that you can see the effect that certain things have on your body. Is that, is that kind of right? 100% and, and being a cyclist especially. As a cyclist, you can push yourself way harder as a runner. When you're a runner, you're limited by your leg conditioning. Right. But on my bike, I can go and jump on my bike and ride 24 hours of no sleep with no real training. But I, I, to run over an hour, your legs are going to get bashed up. So you never really go into your big reserves. But on the bike, it's low impact. You can go all day and night, literally. Yeah. You can cycle, and cycle across Australia like I've done before. And uh, so you learn, you learn really quickly the importance of carbohydrates and water. You learn that and you understand adrenaline, you understand cortisol, the feelings you get when you're, you know, it's called bonking, like hitting the wall, AKA running out of muscle glycogen. You understand that euphoria and then the boom, the crash, where you're just struggling to a hundred watts and you're getting passed by people who don't normally pass you and you're feeling all dizzy and you're feeling ecstasy a bit as well, but you can't do anything. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. It's so a very talk. interesting feeling. It's quite, uh, it's definitely is pleasurable yeah. that you're totally weak and you're just craving some something sweet and juicy, some fruit or a sports drink or some sugar water or whatever. And as soon as you have that bit of fruit, you, you're back in action again. Back, yeah. So you have those carbs and back in action. Excellent. And um, um, so, I mean, you started obviously the website Therapy and Eyes a Day, which is kind of a, and what is it still around, but it's, it was a, le it was really a legendary yeah. website. Back yeah. at that time, it was the, it was basically the online hub for people in the raw vegan movement, especially and, in and vegan. Well. And vegan. I just started freely creative that day. And I said, I, I, I've got, I still got no idea about how to do a website where I'm very you know, literate when it comes to internet. But I said to Freely, I said, you, you start that website. She's better with tech than I am. I said, you start that and I will make that the biggest vegan and raw food site ever. She's like, okay, whatever. And I did. <laughs> and I was just like on it all the time, and uh, it was great fun. It was it was great. It, was, it, it helped so many people unite, and it was just a real. It was a, a massive hub. Unfortunately, when we really part of ways that you know, you know I, I made some mistakes there, making her feel massively rejected. So she was like, anything that I valued, she was happy to see get crushed. Right, uh, which is understandable, being the feminine that she is, but at the expense of community. You know, so that was, you know, she took a power meter off me. She owes me money. She deleted me from the website. She's happy to see it die. Just about, you know, right. <laughs> back at me. Yeah. I'm like, hey, you know, that's, that's, I understand that. And I don't take it personally. And I made some mistakes there, but let's not let the community suffer. You know, and even when we split up, I said, I don't want a war with you. You're like, let's not, let's, let's keep our, you know, we can scream at each other in private, but let's not go online and 
She's like, yeah, I understand that. And I was like, I was like pleading with like, really, do you really understand? It's really important. Like so many people look up to us as a, as a couple, as like the power couple. If they see us fighting, you know, it'd be, it'd be horrendous. And she's yeah. as headstrong as I am. So when she started hitting me online, I was hitting back and then we just, yeah. we hit each other into nonsense. So it was a big mistake for me throwing back. I should have just been silent and let it, let it go. And eventually we just passed over, but me throwing back, freeze throwing back, it just, it was the worst thing ever for both of us to do that. So live and learn. Yeah. I mean, and, and that website, like, do you have any idea, like how many, how many people were visiting that, that website? you know every day was that thousands of people do you have any idea it was it was nuts like it was uh you know it was really awesome how many people were going there it was, we was you know moving a lot of ebook sales there it was uh so that was a, that was a big one as well like how many units you're selling I means people are excited they're like passionate they want to get into it so we were you know definitely it was it was amazing like the you know that was a, a cornerstone of, of of our success and uh also of the community as well because it was just a hub and i understand people want to meet like-minded people you know like sure. especially from the raw food or vegan it's like especially back then it's like where do you meet people what if you're in you know kansas city and like, how, do you, how do you network with how do you find people you know, yeah so it's just great you know, to have people going hey i mean i'm from kansas city or i'm in you know newcastle australia anyone else out there and just be able to people connect so it was really uh it was powerful, powerful. yeah de definitely definitely and, and kind of you know, everyone was on that and everything. And, uh, but, um, it, the, you know, it, looking back to when I was on that, I don't think you were really selling anything on that at the time. And that's the funny, that's another funny thing is like, you got, you guys weren't really taking advantage of that, you know, the way that other people could have or would have if they'd been in that situation. Like you didn't, I don't think you even had a book. I think you may have had an audio or something on it, but I don't think you were heavily promoting anything. Um, we we had our um from 2014 onwards i had my book on there i think i did my first book in 2014 so yeah the yeah so it was up first in 2000 and i think it's february 2009 we got it rolling so yeah for basically four or five years i wasn't selling any product other than i think i had a two dollar audio book on there and uh we would on sometimes sell fred patnard stuff but yeah, we otherwise, you know, it was a massively popular website that wasn't really selling anything. Yeah. And that wasn't the goal. The goal was just to create yeah, yeah. community. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. So, because that's what drives still today. Like, money yeah. is cool, but, you know, I've made more money. I've, I'm set for life with that. And uh, I've learned that money, money's, you know, I've made some insane money. And it, it makes you feel like a bit of a buzz. Like, oh, wow, you can buy fancy bikes and stuff. But, that pays very, very quickly. And my currency now is definitely still contribution. It always right. was, always will be. That's, that's where I get my buzz. You know, you can, I can earn 10 grand a day. It's like, yeah, cool. But if I get to, you know, meet someone who's like been inspired and, you know, they lost weight, but their health better, they're on the bike, they get more performance or whatever. I get World Tour Pro Riders messaging me, you know, like, Harley, can you keep this, our conversation secret? But I've been doing this and, man, my, my FTP is going up and, wow, I'm losing weight. I'm just recovering better. Yeah, the performance is the same. I'm just recovering better, and feeling better. Like, thanks a lot, but keep keep, keep this harsh, you know. So I get athletes and you know, world class level messaging me or you know, like my content or whatever, and or just the everyday mum who's got five kids, single mum, and lives in you know, two slot Oklahoma or whatever, and just saying, you know, I've now got more energy, I don't want to kill myself. You know, thank you very much. I understand the importance of carbohydrates right now. Yeah, so great. That's, that's, that's my that's my currency. That's my payday, and that's what gets me out of bed in the morning, keeps you up late at night. Yeah, and, and I, 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 I want to kind of go back to how you built all that and how you got that attention. And I don't think it was by luck. And I mean, I, I, I've not been around you that much, but the times that I saw you, uh, I mean, I saw you put a lot of work in on the, on the computer doing different things. And I believe you've kind of been famous for all sorts of controversial tactics, like um, creating fake accounts and commenting on your own stuff. And I've always wondered, like, is that part of, were you creating multiple fake accounts and forums and then posting your own videos in those? Is, is that part of the thing you were doing back then? Yeah, let, let, let's get it. Yeah, definitely. That was the tactic I was doing. Um. <laughs> because that, uh, in that, takes, yeah, that, 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 takes, that takes a really, like, a different level of 
like intelligence to do that because yet how did you even manage like all these multiple accounts all these multiple characters like that's almost that's crazy yeah that was crazy i just love it man i love getting the message out there and i love just you know because i feel so bad for all the people out there who never hear the message you know and it, right. it, it, it pains me when my dad he passed away in february 2009 and uh, that was a big motivation for me as well, to get a message out there, to give people an option. If you don't want to do it, like my dad didn't want to change his diet. He was happy to do radio and, uh, you know, and chemo and all that stuff and just and check off the planet within six weeks. He was happy to do that. And I accepted that. It was hard. I remember hugging him goodbye. I said, this is the last time I'd see you. I accept your choices. I think you're doing it wrong, but it's your life. It's your choice. And I remember getting, being on the plane, you know, flying back to Adelaide, just thinking, man, like my dad just, he just blindly believes the oncologist, you know, right. he just blindly believes them. And uh, I was like, man, like, where's the options? People don't have any options, you know? And yeah. so I just thought, I'm going to smash this word out there to try and reach the people who are looking for options. I understand that 99% of people out there would rather die than change their diet and lifestyle. I understand that at a core level now, but I want to reach that 1% of people out there who go, I want an option. And so, yeah, I was just like, how do I do this? You know, listening to a lot of Tony Robbins stuff is like ask right, ask the right questions. I'm like, well, how do I, how do I do this? And seeing back then it was forums, you know. Yeah. And so using my own forum, Thirty Bad, and then I'd get on like Mark Sisson's forum or any forum I could, and I'd use the the handle Duran Rider, and within a day I'd be <laughs> deleted and banned because I was <laughs> pushing the vegan agenda. And so I started going, you know, back in back there back into the websites of those people and it's using fake accounts, you know, like Paleo Runner or whatever, just, just these random accounts. I'm <laughs> like, hey, what do these journal writer guys, this guy clown or what? And I'd post my, you know, pro-carbohydrate message in the, in the video or you know, before and after shots of bikinis, girls like Freely or whatever. And it would get people thinking in the comments, get discussions going. So I did that every day, like 10 hours a day, all forums and all these different accounts and just spamming yeah. it. Hardcore yeah, that, just to get people thinking, give people yeah. the option. That's the crazy work ethic that, like, cause I, that, that's kind of what, I, I don't know, I, I kind of put that together in my own mind that you were going on other people's forums with fake accounts and basically saying, look at this idiot Durian rider, what do you think of, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, 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 and then there was even like, there was a point where there was a, there was like a 30 bananas a day sucks website oh, yeah. at the time, and it was like, I, I think you were probably like the one the person most on that with like all these different <laughs> multiple characters as well. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> that that was it was great. That was such a, an apprenticeship, and I wasn't making a single dollar. You know, that was I, my, my YouTube account wasn't even monetized. That right. started in like 2011, 2012. So I was on all these forums just because I wanted to help people. You know, that, to give them such, an option. Harley, that's such a lesson because what I've seen, what you've seen, obviously, is people that come into the whatever movement, vegan, plant based, raw food, whatever, and they get in it and they just want to get right to the top like and that's all they're about it's like they just want to like you've called it social climbers or whatever but you just see people that they're so motivated to just try and climb up to the top for, and i don't exactly know why um i've seen that at woodstock many times because I've, I've been to that event a lot i see people coming in one year they're the, the new to it the next year they're like trying to give a talk they're trying to run the thing <laughs> like and yeah. and then the next year they're no longer vegan they're no longer raw they're like they're totally against it and it's just like what uh, yeah they're just using they're, i mean everybody wants significance everybody loves significance right you know, we, we love to feel significant we love praise we and some people you know narcissism everyone's narcissist to a degree but if you're a high level narcissist you're just you run on significance you run on praise so you know in today's social media world just to look at Oh, there's money there. There's praise there. I can go and jump into here, you know, and you, uh, you know, that sort of attracts a lot of different types of people. And uh, then the narcissists, the ones who generally do well, because they'll step on anyone, they'll they'll friend anyone they can, and then step on them and stab them in the back just to get a, a one up on the social ladder. And so that's why, uh, yeah, we, we attract that sort of level of people. And uh, it's you know, it's a, it's a tough one out there. But end of the day, you know time exposes all and uh and, and you see these people going ex-vegan it's just like you're never right. vegan to start with really if you really believe in <laughs> vegan you would find a way to succeed you'd just like you'd message me or you'd be like hey Carl, you know you're, you've been vegan athlete for 18 years like how 
Yeah. And right. I'm not even after it. I'm, I can't do it. Like, what are you doing? And, uh, but these people were just using the vegan scene, the raw food scene, just to make some money, a bit of fame, a bit of significance, a bit of narcissistic supply. Uh, what do you think caused the that kind of ex-vegan thing? It seemed to happen last year, a whole bunch, like just one after just a, another. Just another trend. Just right. another trend. Raw food is a trend. Vegans are trending. High carbs trending. Freely is trending. Do not is trending. Such and such is trending. It's just trends people follow. It's like fashions or whatever. People just, a sunglass design, people are, buzzing on that for a year or two and then the next design comes out so they drop it so the ex-vegan things do you feel it's faded off a bit yeah i think so yeah yeah it hits a peak and then fades like bitcoin or whatever it's just you know i don't even like bitcoin but these things have a trend you know like during night is bad i'll unfollow him okay that's a trend and then you know ex-vegans are trend and this is these trends generally the ex-vegan thing it was you know, let's use an example. We've got Bonnie, Rebecca, Tim yeah. Sheaf, or uh, Rovana. Three people I helped get onto this YouTube platform and push them up, especially Bonnie, especially Rovana. I remember, the, I remember the first day I, was, I met Bonnie and said, You should get on YouTube and you do well. I'm just like, do you think yeah. so? Same with Rovana in New York there. I said, Get on YouTube, help you get going. And um, but yeah, then they started doing the Dr. Gregor thing and they're just following trends. Right. And they, when they followed myself, they were doing great and looked great. Bonnie had glow. She was riding a bike. She had the best fitness. And then they just, when I stopped trending after the drama, then these girls and guys, they don't, they drop the trend. They're like, oh, I can't wear this t-shirt because this is not trending anymore. I'll go for this t-shirt. Even this, even though this t-shirt will make me really bad performance wise, I'll follow it because I'm attached to trends. I've got to be popular in what's, in what's the latest and greatest. Even though it's not the greatest, it's the latest. I'll go with that. For these people, the latest is the greatest, even if the latest is the worst, if that makes <laughs> sense. So they follow Gregor, and then the Gregor plan is like, you know, weigh yourself multiple times a day, four cups of coffee a day. And these people who hadn't had coffee for ages started smashing the coffee, getting all like high and mighty and flighty, eating less, and then just feeling, you know, really lethargic and next day caffeine blues, feeling depressed and go, oh, I'm not getting enough nutrients and my diet's not balanced enough. I maybe need to go see a naturopath or yeah. a sociopath, psychopath. Yeah. <laughs> and then they just, they just go, well, I need to eat fish. I need to eat chicken. I need, and I need to drink my own urine. I need to do a water fast 20 yeah. days. So, oh, Stop following the latest. The latest isn't the greatest. Follow the fundamentals. Yeah. And uh, there's something I want to get into there about we were talking about the breath and thing, but the eating less thing or, or not eating enough, there's always been a yeah. classic thing in the raw food, especially in the raw food, but probably in vegan as well, of people failing at it because they're not eating enough. And you were one of the biggest advocates back in the day for making sure people knew exactly how much to eat, that they were eating enough, that they were not restricting at all. Um, yeah. Why is that an issue, like with, with especially with raw, the raw vegan thing? What what is the why why does that why do people not instinctively eat, eat enough i think that yeah you know, a lot of us uh a lot of us come from like i came from a background of cycling and cycling is about body weight right? so i never ever had an eating disorder i did have disordered eating you know thinking i'm gonna get leaner and leaner and performance goes up and it does to a degree and then you, you decline so if you're if you're a cyclist, you focus about weight. If you're a runner, you focus about weight. So you gravitate towards vegan and fruitarianism just because it makes sense uh, with weight. Right. But you have people with you know with clinical anorexia, people who have had bulimia, they starve themselves, and you know to, to really low body mass index is where the performance is just tanks. But they don't care because it's all about being skinny for them. And so then they'll be attracted to uh, they'll be attracted to uh, to this lifestyle. Ronnie, yeah. I need you to have a piss. Can we just, can we just pause it for a sec? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> right, right, cool. Um, what I wanted to kind of go into a little bit, you, you're a guy who's been surrounded by so much controversy over the years, right? Um, Gosh, yeah. Let's go <laughs> And part, I, I don't know how much you've courted that for YouTube. I don't know if you did that on purpose or whatever, but um, let's, say, let's talk about the Woodstock Fruit Festival a little bit. Like, how did that all come together, even just you know, let me, I'd like to hear the story of how you ended up there. And as far as I can see, Therapy Bananas a Day was a huge part of that festival, you know, attracting an audience as far as I know. Yeah, it was, 
that was a Woodstock Fruit Festival, great times. Mike Arnstein got a lot of time and support from Mike. Um, even though we had some differences of opinion there, I just, I liked the vision that Mike's had. And when I first talked to him back in, I think we, it was late 2010. No, no, before we, I was talking to Mike for maybe a year hand, a year mm. before, because he was a runner and he was asking me some questions. And, and so yeah, me and Mike would be talking about cycling and running. And, and uh, so we, we got along really, really well. And he's like, I've got this idea. I want to do a, uh, you know, I want to do a Wall Street festival. Like, That's a great idea. And Mike is just an organised dude. Like, I don't know how he does it. He's got the family and his business and his fitness and all the stuff he goes through. And so yeah. Mike is also a big inspiration for me. Like living with Mike in New York, it was it was a game changer for me. It was a game changer. I like I get sort of shivers a little bit of the times there. It was just like it was like a dream come true going to New York and running around doing the running races in Van Cortland Park and stuff like that. Sure. And that was good times. But how did I get going? Um, Mike wanted to use our platform, 30 Bad, to uh, to promote the event. And uh, so we put a big banner up there. I think he, he uh, what was it? Yeah, we, we did that. We had a big Woodstock banner that Ann Osborne created. It was really good. Ann Osborne does a great art. And that, that was good times, man. That was fun times. And then 2011, was in that first venue we did it and it was just great it was like the vibe was just epic you know it was just epic vibe uh you know great times the fruit quality was was okay which is i'm gonna say to mike i'm like how are you gonna organize good fruit for everybody it's just so tough to have the right fruit you know? and us fruit to other people us fruit loves are pretty fussy but i mean the fruit was it was better than i could get it and uh you couldn't do that in a bit in australia the fruit quality is just too poor and then we get Mike did it, did it well. We I promoted it heavily because I really believed in it, and I just love being in that environment, helping people out. And it's just you know when you get to spend time with people and people can ask you questions face to face, and they can ask you anything. It was just that's very powerful. And so it was like Doug Graham's you know fitness camp where I got to ask Doug questions, you know, sit at the dinner table and ask him questions and questions and questions, and he'd answer anything. And so that, that environment, we just learn so quickly when you sit down and just ask all these questions as a new. And so understanding how powerful Doug event was back in the day, but how expensive his event was as well. And then seeing Woodstock at a lot more affordable price, more people just, yeah, I was fully backing that as a powerful tool to help people transition to the lifestyle. And so I was all for it. And so I was promoting it heavily. Every video I think I did, I'd have a plugging it and, uh, and it was great. And Mike, he flew us over. He paid for our flights there, and he put us up at his house in uh, in Yonkers there. And uh, that was a great experience. That was a great time, man. I, I had some incredible life changing experiences there. Really good times, and that, that pushed me off even more in my uh, my lifestyle, career, and impacts. And as a, as a speaker as well, like my voice was burnt out. I would talk to so many people, and I think Woodstock. It, it helped me become a better speaker because my voice was cooked. I would basically, from 6 a.m. till midnight or so, I was answering questions from people nonstop. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to do that. Absolutely. And I love yeah. that. And, yeah. so I mean, great I, training. And I saw that. I saw that a lot, Harley. And, and I've always said, like, you got there's always a slightly difference between the character of Durian Rider a little bit and the person in real life, I think. And um, what I have always said to people, is that at Woodstock and in those situations, you were the one by far speaking to the most people, answering the most questions, open to, I mean, I don't want to name names, but there were presenters that were almost hiding away from people. <laughs> like they did, they, they, they were freaking out with the attention and they were like hiding away in their room and stuff. You were always out there, always in the middle of things, always answering questions, never trying to attract attention to yourself. Like you were, you, you weren't trying to be, the big king at the table, you know what I mean? You were always just like another person at the, the event. I remember seeing you like pushing people up the hill on the bike, you know, things that people wouldn't have ever, wouldn't see, wouldn't think that's what Durian Rider is like, you know? Um, yeah. So I've, I, you know, I've always shared with that with people whenever they've asked, oh, what's, what was Harley like or whatever? I've always said, well, in, in, in reality, he was the guy that was really, the, the easiest to talk to, the most approachable, speaking to the most people. Like, so I, I, I totally agree with you on that. I, I saw that as well. Yeah, that, that's, I always treat people well, I'm like, because I was a noob and everyone's a noob, a beginner. 
And so I think you've got to treat people how you'd want to be treated. And I remember you know, being on my bike in 1996, doing a 100K ride for the first time ever, and a pack of roadies, you know, they, they came past me. And I tried to get in the back of them, and I couldn't. And one of them held back a bit, and he's like, oh, you know, mate, make sure you get your water in there. And you're doing good, mate. And it's a hot day today. You're doing good. Don't try and keep up. You know, you just just keep chugging away. And, yeah. and they just, like, lifted me up. And yeah. I was just total new. And then uh, going to the bike shops, people have out of advice and stuff like that. And so when I had all these, you know, beginners and noobs coming to me saying, I'm inspired by your Harley, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, this, you know, without these people, who am I? I'm nothing. I'm just you know, an everyday dude doing his thing. So I, I, I always got to give time to people, you know, and that's why I do so much content still today because I can give to people. People can sit and watch 5,000 or so of my videos for free and then everything, you know. Yeah. So. If they want more, they can grab my ebook or whatever, or join my coaching group. But I'll put out so much free sure. content to help people. And, and it, it's great. Woodstock was great at times. But eventually, obviously, uh, there was a falling out at Woodstock. And, and I don't know the full story behind that, but I, 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 <laughs> what, what, what came out publicly was you were changed from a pioneer to a special guest or something. And because you, you were no longer 100% raw. And yeah. And then it seemed like you guys just decided to put the story out there that you'd been thrown out of the, the event. I don't know if that's what it felt like to you. I don't think you were officially thrown out, but... No, we weren't thrown out. I don't think I, don't think I ever said we were thrown out because we weren't thrown out. Right. We were... The, the difference between the pioneer and a special guest is Mike Arnstein, being the smart guy he is, he introduced a, uh, a payment system where... When people buy their ticket for Woodstock, they could donate 50 bucks or 100 bucks to their favorite, you know, pioneer, their guest speaker sure. of choice. And uh, so, you know, I became like the top person people were donating to, you know, and I think Frieda was second and Doug was maybe down the line. And so, you know, I took home a lot of money from that and Doug saw that and Doug being <laughs> ultra, ultra money focused, it was like, hang on. Harley's become competition now for money. I don't like that. And so Doug was saying, oh, Harley's giving people B12 injections. And the yeah, one guy fainted. And, you know, he's, he's promoting cooked food. There's like this backup option. What's he doing here as a pioneer, you know? So that, the issue was just the money. Before that, Doug was totally fine with that. But once the, you know, I started making all this money that he wasn't making, all of a sudden it's like, you know, so I was no longer a friend of Doug. I was like, you know, competition financially. And he's like, get him out. As, as a money source. And so I guess I took that sort of person and so freely. And I was just like, hey, you know what? Why don't we create our own event? And Freely's like, eh, I don't really want to do that. I said, well, I'm going to do that. And I created this event in Thailand, in Chiang Mai, mm -hmm. the Fort White Festival. And I did that in 2014 by myself. I think it was three weeks long. And that was, and that was off the charts. You know, but that was yeah, off the charts. But go back, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But are you saying that, do you think it was Doug that, that was the main? conspirator to try and get you removed from the festival in some way or yeah from what mike told me and from christina's lack of involvement because she was sort of friends with me and friends with dog and she's like oh i'm not going to vote for anyone i'm just going to step back and so yeah it was uh it was um you know doug doug, doug was the catalyst of that yeah what's that sorry doug, doug was the catalyst of that of us being removed yeah. from the pioneer list okay the payment list and uh so yeah, and, and I guess I just, I, I could see that it was becoming more and more about purity and, you know, and I didn't want to cause dramas for Mike, you know, I, I believed in the event. I didn't want to go to Woodstock again and, and have just tension. So I said, okay, Harley, you know, do your own event, right? Do your own event, your own rules. No one can complain, blah, 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 you know? And I, I still promoted Woodstock. I said, if you want to go there, go there. It's a great event. I still believe that to this day. I just thought, well, you know, would I go back to Woodstock for sure? At the time that I felt it was just best to create my own event and, you know, go from yeah. there. At, at, and that, that was it. It was a massive free event and uh, yeah. it, was, it was party time. But, at, I mean, at that time as well, like, you... Uh, I mean, I've, I've, I've never heard Doug say that he was the main cat. I, I guess that maybe he wouldn't admit to that. I don't know, but... Um, it's... It's... it's but it's kind of weird to me because I, I don't know if 
I don't understand how people didn't see that it was kind of obvious that you were one of the main reasons that the event had was getting somewhere. And also, you were really one of the main energies behind the whole 80-10-10 phenomenon. You know, that book becoming, uh, it's probably selling over 100,000 copies, you know, and, and um, Doug, sure, mentioned, was, was, Doug, Doug mentioned that, a lot from that, you know. Doug never paid me a cent, ever. And I didn't ask for any money. I wouldn't have gotten any either if I ever asked him. But Doug never paid me a cent. I never asked him for anything. But I believed in his teaching so much. I was promoting him for free. I was doing videos about him. And Doug, some of them get like 50,000, 100,000 views, which was huge back in the day. Sure. And so I was like the, you know, I was the sort of poster boy-ish, if you want to call it that, or the main promoter right. of 801010. I was giving it like validation as an athlete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I think it's a, it's a great thing in, in a raw food world of calorie restriction, Doug wasn't overly promoting that calorie restriction. So I was like, give 80, 10, 10, the booth stop. And it was, it's great. It's, it's, if you yeah, got raw food, that's, that's the way to go. Because the, the way that I saw it at the time was like, I remember, um, you know, and I was following you, a bunch of people were following you and seeing and what you were doing and what you were doing is working. And then you were basically saying, but this is the guy that you should, you know, this is the book you should. So, Everyone thought Doug was the man because you were the man online, but you were saying, no, this guy's the man. So everyone was like, that guy must really be the man, right? And then at Woodstock, as you remember, the pioneers were all announced. You, Christina, Chris Kendall, everyone else. And then Doug was the last one. It was like, everyone stands up, stand in ovation and all that That's stuff. Right. And, and I remember that like, it was weird because I remember he started talking about his house and it was, it was just a weird moment. It was like, that's not what the audience was really looking for f from him. You know, like he was, I, and I wonder if he, I sometimes, uh, I wonder if in that moment he didn't realize that everyone kind of saw him or were looking to him to be the leader. And um, maybe he wasn't comfortable with doing that. I don't know. Yeah, Doug is, uh, I've got no hard feelings towards Doug, got no hate for Doug. Um, you know, I still got a lot of mutual friends and stuff like that. It's, it's no issues. It's just as a person, I think Doug can improve by taking, you know, he, he can't admit he's wrong. You know, and I think if you can't admit you're wrong in life, everybody makes mistakes. I make mistakes. We all make mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes, but I'll take accountability for that. I'll say, I was wrong. I'm sorry. How can I make it better? And I think that that's a huge thing in life is you've got to have that self accountability. Doug doesn't have that, in my opinion, my experience. And so he, he just can't see for whatever reason, maybe it's insecurity or whatever. It's like, if he makes a mistake, he's like, you know, I can't fail. Maybe it's his A type personality. But if you have that in life, you just, you suffer. People around you suffer because you just can never say you're wrong. And so I think being able to say, you know what? You're right. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. How can I make it better? That's one of the cornerstones for a happy life. It doesn't matter how good your diet is. If you don't have that, it's going to age you and rot you from the inside. And so, uh, and that's, uh, that's a, that's a huge one I've worked on over the last 15 years of just having accountability, you know, mm. and, uh, and saying, yeah, I was wrong. But you, I, I mean, sorry. I mean, you, um, after that whole situation, you kind of online, you kind of attacked Christina quite a lot. You obviously, yeah, uh, this totally, yeah, yeah. this is so easy this is from Doug. Um, did you feel personally like they'd kind of let you down? Is that is that what happened? Yeah, that's, that's what it was. I've got, got no hate to Christina either. You know, I haven't talked to her for ages, but, you know, first I met her was in Doug's camp in 2006. And, uh, and I guess, you know, I, I helped Christina get a career going with YouTube and I was telling her what to wear and what to say and videos and, you know, all that stuff. So I, I felt I helped her get her YouTube career launched. And then uh, when she sort of flaked out, you know, on the Woodstock voting thing, I was just like, oh, man, like, you know, I just, I just expected more of it. And I, I, when you got expectations of people and they don't meet them, then yeah, you naturally feel disappointed. So I just, I felt, you know, I felt uh, let down by Christina and me being me, putting my feelings up on YouTube. People ask me my, my opinion and I'd, I'd share my opinion. So yeah, but yeah, no hard feelings to Christina. Um, yeah. I also uh, told her to give up her raw food co-op because it was just, draining it too much and eventually she's done that so that's good to see i hope she's doing well right and um and obviously and and, and you, you kind of went from being doug's biggest supporter in a way to like 
kind of, critical. Yeah, and a lot of people came after you and uh, kind of went after Doug after that with some of the things that happened with the, the girl at the fast team. Yeah, Lee. Like, I think her name was Leah. Leah Braster. Um, was, yeah, Lee Braster. So I think she almost died during a water fast that had to have a blood transfusion. And, and just, and things like that happen. But the fact, just how Doug tried to keep it secret I was like, man, that's that's not ethical, man. Like, you, you're trying to get her to sign a non-disclosure, and it, it's like an NDA. It's just, no, nah, man. That's just, you know, just admit you made a mistake, or admit that you should screen people better before a fast. Like, people should, you know, you should test them for anemia before they fast. Like, it's, because that costs money, doesn't do that. You know, so it's just, I don't know. I just lost a lot of respect for Doug as a person, out how way you know he instructed. Uh, events and stuff like that. It just, uh, yeah, I'll, I lost a lot of faith there. You know? mm -hmm. so, yeah. And I, I don't I mean, believe in wood parts anymore. I've seen I mean, that. And I've heard the other side to the story a little bit with people that were at that event that were saying that, that Leah was, was fine and was not anywhere near as bad as she, she kind of claimed to be after it. And, I, you know, I, I, I don't really know exactly what went on there, but um, anyway. The fact that she went to the hospital and had a blood transfusion, you know, it, it seemed pretty, you know, you, you're not going to go to hospital and then they're not going to admit you and give you blood transfusion unless you need it. You know? Right. Right. So, yeah. so uh, you went from there to obviously, as you say, you started the Thai fruit fest and uh, that was, as you say, a pretty, that was a pretty big event. It, was, it, it wasn't like it was in competition. We would talk about a totally different thing, but it yeah, was it's no money. It was just different style. It was cooked food. It was, you know, your own, your own accommodation. Yeah, Woodstock is like the one-stop shop. Like you just go there, everything's taken care of, food, accommodation, speaking, everything. Yeah, my event was just <laughs> chaos and just, just a big, <laughs> big rat pack, just a big rat pack of uh, carb lovers. And yeah, you know, <laughs> how many years does that? How many years does that go on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, the, but, 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 but this is the funny thing, Harley, because like you had this big following who were following you with the fruit thing and the raw thing. A lot of them kind of faded off when you went away, when you went back to, you know, cook food and everything. Then you got this new following that was all the car, as you say, the carb lovers, uh, plant-based, whatever you want to call it, Rosso 4. And um, they were all, you know, following you and they were all dissing the thing you did in the past, like uh, and they were all joined in with um, this and Doug Graham and, and Woodstock and all that kind of stuff. But uh, gradually, a lot of those people turned on you as well. <laughs> like a lot of the people yeah. in the Ross and Four thing, uh, High Carb Hannah, Derek, people like that. Once again, it probably got quite a lot of their start from your inspiration, I guess. Yeah, uh, Hannah left a Great comment on my channel the other other week, other month. She left a very supportive comment um, saying, you know, I wouldn't be here without you. Hi, Carb Hanno. And, and uh, that's what, that, was, that was great. That was great. You know, showed gratitude. And uh, I really appreciated that. Even though, uh, you know, Hanno, you know, she's got a, she's used a bit of my angle, creating controversy and got a channel going. And then she started making videos about me. And I, me I messaged her and I said, look, I, I wrote an email. I said, Hanno, like, you know, you could be really big. You could be a lot bigger than you are now. Let me support you. Let me give you some tips. Let me, you know, help you with the thumbnails. Let me help you with content. But what I ask is you remove the negative videos about me and Freely. And she's like, okay, deal. And I was like, smart girl, you know, and then bang, her channel just, she launched right up. And I'm like, I'm, I just want to help people. Right. You know, and if you want to help me, I want to help you as well, you know, and it's just a win-win. So Hannah was very smart like that. And, uh, she just can see the logic and she, she, I think she's got a good heart. And, uh, and so, yeah, so that was, uh, that was, Hannah was a great example of someone who maybe felt a bit rejected by me or freely or, and for our you know, stuff, you guys make a video about you and, and that works. And then she got a bit of traction, but then also she was like, well, you know, at what expense is this for our community? You know, so then she has a good heart and, you know, and, and, mm. and so she worked with me in the end and, she did really well. And I said, you know, like anyone, if, if you work with me, especially if you've got talent like Hannah does, then you're going to do really, really well. And if you work against me, then it just, it just helps, hurts the community. And if it hurts yeah. the community, it hurts you and it hurts me. So it's so lose-lose. 
so you, you went, the, the Rottle 4 thing became a bit of a phenomenon online. A lot of people were following that. Um, yep. There was a lot of people that were critical of some of your advice, like about unlimited carbohydrates and stuff like that. And, and then there was people that were kind of claiming that they were putting on a lot of weight eating like that. What was your opinion about that? Do you think they were really following it or? No, they weren't. <laughs> I mean, he, he, okay, this is what I love about being a coach of coaching people for free for so many years yeah. and having these free events because it was like, oh, like my, my doctor friends tell me that the, they learn the most when they actually work in the hospitals or work in the clinics and as a student doctor or whatever, they got all these yeah. people coming in with like infections and I've got this thing on my finger, I think it's a spider bite or whatever. And so it's like when you see different cases and different things, you learn really quickly. You can read all the books and, study everything but when you in real life application and someone's in your face and they're like super anorexic or they're super obese or they're yeah. on thyroid medication or they're you know you get to learn so much quicker and so i learned that you know if you're fat and you're following my program it's one of two things you're not following it you, you're sneaking on the side which is human behavior two you've come from a period of anorexia restriction where you've developed a lot of thyroid and insulin resistance issues. So when you start refeeding, you, you, you gain. And there's a great proof of that now uh, for people to follow is the, a girl called Stephanie Butterfield or Stephanie Buttermore, who was you know, a, a, a fitness competitor, a bikini competition girl who was using clenbuterol and starving herself and getting really skinny to like Natasha's level, but doing it the wrong way with drugs and starvation. And now she's you know, refeeding, she's, she's you know, gaining a lot of weight. Some yeah. people would call her obese or fat or whatever. She's, you know, she's larger than she was. And it's a great example of adaptive thermogenesis. And so these people who are coming to me and they're the, mostly girls are inspired by Freely's before I transition. And, uh, and they're, yeah, they're attached to that. Cause I want to, I want to get a body like Freely. And so they'd be coming to me like, how'd you get Freely to that level? And I'm like, well, we do this, we do that. We eat as much as we want. And so these girls have gained from adaptive thermogenesis. And then, uh, you know, and then wait and come back down again. And they'd be looking great and feeling great. But a lot of girls wouldn't do the time. They just think, like, I'm gaining weight. This is working. They'll jump to some other trend. Sure, sure. The ones who say, I'm really doing it. And I'm like, well, you're 95 kilos and you're the same height as Freely. You're not doing it. That's not adaptive thermogenesis. That's yeah, yeah. KFC thermogenesis, all right? You're going to gain. But if you're gaining that much, no, you're sneaking. You're what, sneaking. What? And so then what people would do would use these examples as examples of like, hey, Harley's program doesn't work. And it's like, well, why don't you, you know, use my girlfriend's as examples versus some weirdo on taking heaps of medication yeah. that's caused a lot of weight gain. Uh, what's the kind of size behind that? Because as far as I'm aware, if you if you have a diet where you overeat carbohydrates, it's totally different than a diet where you're overeating on fat in terms of the ability to, of the body to gain weight. And the, the, if, when the body, when you when you, eat over your caloric needs in terms of carbohydrates that it's more difficult for the body to store that as fat or potentially it doesn't store it much as fat. Well, can you clear that up a little bit? Well, yeah, it's when you eat fat, the body stores it as fat, excess protein stored as fat, excess carbohydrate, your body pees it out or burns it by dietary thermogenesis, AKA you start sweating, you get hot, You'll take off your jacket or peel off a bit. What, what does it get stored as fat? It can. If you have if you have a period of restricting, maybe did some intermittent fasting or water fasting or keto diet or any carbohydrate restrictive diet beforehand, then your metabolism, your thyroid mostly, and your insulin, your fasting insulin levels are going to be all whacked out. Your fasting insulin will be higher, your thyroid will be lower, your TSH, your thyroid stimulating hormone will be higher because your body's trying to you know, stimulate your, your T4 production. And so then when you come over to this model of recommendation, unlimited carbs, you're like, unlimited carbs, what? And you just start chowing down because your body's like, eat, eat, eat. And so you're going to gain weight. And you have to, and that's correct. At healing your thyroid, at helping your insulin resistance, at, you know, reversing your adaptive thermogenesis. And so there's this period of weight gain. You hit a ceiling and you don't, you don't become obese. You come like, you know, a bit roundish. Mm -hmm. And then over time, it's going to go down. But let's say you're doing the Stephanie Buttermore thing and you're eating chicken and fat and all the grease and the Krispy Kreme donuts, then the weights, that's how people get obese. Yeah. And I knew a girl in high school, she was, you know, amazing body, you know, 
Her name was Kylie, and she had this you know, fit, tight body. And then I remember seeing her after high school and she was like morbidly obese. Mm. And I was like, what? How does that happen? That was back in 1994. And so from 94 onwards, I was like just amazed at weight gain and weight loss. And like, we just thought Kylie was just naturally hot and naturally you know, right. fit yeah, and yeah. stuff. But she was obviously you know, doing some restricting there. And uh, so, yeah, that, so, so from 94 onwards, I was just like amazed how the human body works like mm. genuinely amazed and still to this day with you know with steroids or weight loss or athletics or all sorts of things i really i don't know what it is i just love studying humans and spiders and bugs and snakes and cats and whatever i just love that animal behavior and understanding that sure that's my passion sure so, and uh, but uh, go back to your event you know that didn't come without its controversies again I, i've seen videos of you like in arguments with people or fights or whatever it was, I'm not sure what it was. Um, and uh, obviously there was a, there was a lot of allegations surrounding you and, and a few women that were saying oh, yeah. kind of inappropriate behavior or whatever and a lot of stuff coming out about you being a narcissist and all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> and I, you know... Let's, let's get into it if you want. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I've not really got any opinion. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. Like, yeah, yeah whatever I, I don't personally think you're a narcissist from what i've seen of you or being around you and all that but i don't know you super well but yeah what, what what's your side of that i'm definitely a narcissist to some degree i believe everybody is right. everybody's a bit crazy everybody's a bit narcissist but it's whether or not your craziness or your narcissism is starting to impact other people negatively so everyone's aggressive everyone's got their uh -huh. violent streak everyone's got a temper but how bad is that yeah. how bad does it affect other people in your life mm -hmm. and so yeah it's uh let's talk about the, the, the there was we did a few videos in thailand we did troll videos where i was dressed up in a banana outfit throwing someone's bike wheels into the lake and that was just you know, there's a lot of troll videos during on assault to me there was troll stuff there was um and some people believe that stuff is real but it's just totally trolling and acting and there was one altercation altercation we had on the hill on the yeah. doy with sam sam mccallum <laughs> where I was screaming at him, I was super frustrated. You know, he tried to get my YouTube channel taken down. I was just, you know, I wasn't going to hit him because he's a, a semi-mate and he's a lot smaller than I was. And just, you know, hitting someone for one is wrong. Two, was, someone small is wrong. Wasn't there, wasn't there guys as well that were coming to your festival and they were just like really irresponsible cycling down the hill, like really fast, really dangerous. Yeah. Wasn't there that kind of stuff going on as well? I mean, there was people going to hospital, you know, every second day with broken collarbones, broken leg, one girl smashed the teeth. It just, it was just, you know, it's, it was, it was out of hand. So crazy. It was, you know, I was there by myself trying to control this craziness. <laughs> uh, and so I felt like the angry dad. Was, like, <laughs> the so the day I saw Sam up the door, I was just, I was just, you know, I, uh, I just said, what are you doing? You know, I was just screaming at him and, and then he filmed that, put it onto YouTube and, uh, and we're all good now. We talk. We talked about it afterwards, so it's all good. So someone might see that video and go, oh my God, Harley's crazy. But it's like, they don't see afterwards that, you know, I talked to Sam, it's like, hey mate, whatever. Like, it's, there's no hard feelings there. He doesn't fear me or whatever, there's no, but if someone saw that video yeah. about the contents, you know, I could, you know, I was sitting with Sam at dinner, like a year later talking about it and saying, you're, you know, you're an idiot, put that content up, it just doesn't make us look good. Um, so that's all good now. And, uh, even recently, someone uploaded it to the internet, and I said to Sam, "Hey, can you get this taken down?" He took it down. You know, so it's it's great there. And uh, and then there was the one with Hannah and uh, her boyfriend Michael from Norway, who made 130 videos about me, aka Norvegian. <laughs> and that was basically uh, me and Philly split up in 2015. And the first time uh, it was about October, and you know, Philly broke up with me the first time. I broke up with her the last right. time. But, uh, the first time she broke up with me, so I was, I was just like. Okay, I felt you know a lot of rejection. I was just like, what's going on? Like, you broke up with the phone. I was just like, you know what? I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna stop living my life then. And so, you know, as you've seen, I have a lot of female fans, and you know, we're in Chiang Mai, and, and uh, so I had all these, you know, all these uh, fangirls and friends. I called them friends at the time, you know, and they were just they could just sniff something was wrong. And so Hannah was one of them. So she came to the hotel room a few times there, and uh, we had, we started with a vegan skin. And then her boyfriend found out 
And uh, so she, uh, you know, Michael found out a year later. And so she sort of changed the story with him. She didn't, you know, she obviously never went on record and said anything bad happened because nothing ever did. But this Michael guy felt, uh, felt like he you know, something bad did happen. So he sort of orchestrated a story. And I'm like, well, why don't you go to the police? <laughs> like, I'm not a hard guy to find. Let's, let's go to court. Let's, let's do whatever you want. You know, let's, let's have Hannah there as well. Let's do a polygraph and let's talk about all the emails and photos and that she sent me afterwards and uh, all, all the consensual activities went on that night. And so, uh, yeah, and then, then uh, he created a website about me, trying to paint me as some sort of rapist or whatever. And I'm like, well, there's not a single woman out there on the internet has ever said, Drew Rider or Harley has raped me, because that's never, ever happened. And so he, people paint this fake social narrative of, uh, of whatever. And then there was a girl called Josie, who uh, we hooked up, we had sex maybe 20 or 30 times there. And she was, you know, mad into me. And I was just like, you know, I was single at the time, that's in 2016. And she was a cool girl, she was great. And I remember buying her a computer because she told me the story where she was dead broke and she had no money and the computer was dodgy. So I bought her a computer and I said, um, you can have this computer. If you upload every day for a year, you can have this computer. It was a nice computer. If you don't, upload every day on YouTube and you have to give the computer back. She's like, oh, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. So it's, it's a deal. She said, yeah, we shook hands and then uh, she stopped uploading content and we still talk. I said, well, you know, you, you broke the deal. I have to get the computer back off. And she goes, yeah, no worries. And this is in 2017. Um, and I said, hey, Jason, I'm in town. You're in town, can I get that computer off you? And she started to get all like, well, I don't have it anymore. And I'm like, what do you mean you have it? Like, that's the deal. <laughs> and I said, look, you know, where is it? You know, I want to come over and I'm get the computer. I said, actually, don't worry about that. You just you drop it off at this restaurant. And she's like, why are you going to give it to her? And I'm like, I'm not giving it to her. I'm just going to pick it up. I'm like, it's my computer. And so she started getting all like bratty on me. And I said, look, you know what? I'll get the police involved. And she's like, fine. And so I went over to her apartment and got the police to come along. And uh, they were going to arrest her on theft if she didn't give the computer back. And then she gave it back. And that was it. What I did wrong there, though, was, you know, Josie was talking crap to me so I was talking crap back to her and then that Michael uh, Hebo Norvegian guy got wind of that so he used <laughs> Josie as a bit of a pawn to like you know he did a video I think it's called uh, another girl comes forward or whatever and it's like comes forward with what you know there's no allegations <laughs> in the video at all but using the title of like you know something bad happened when nothing bad happened what what the mistake I made was having sex with these girls you know at an intensity where they got attached and then they felt rejected and I didn't meet their expectations. Yeah. And then they felt hurt. And when, when her hurt girl gets the shot to get back at you and you're a guy, then, you know, you better hope that, uh, hope that you got the evidence there to back up. And so uh, that's what happened. That's what happened. Right. Yeah. It's just Josie and Hannah. And I've got no hard feelings towards them. I understand that, you know, they probably don't understand how, uh, how bad it was to the community and how bad people will look at them and their reputation. Like if you're a guy and you know Hannah or Josie, then you're going to be like, hang on, like you just, you guys lied hard. Right. We didn't even lie. You let people lie about Harley and you didn't clear it up. That's pretty, that's pretty, that's right, pretty bad. Right, right, right. And you have to live with that pain. That's, that's going to eat you up. That's a now, big lie. To a, a lot of people that were obviously had an agenda against you kind of used that at the time you know, jumped on that bandwagon, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, so uh, uh, is that event finished now? You don't do that so much or? Uh... It, it got too big. It got out of hands. It, yeah, yeah. Someone was going to die on the joy. <laughs> it was, people just weren't listening to me. And so it was causing me, it, as much as I loved helping people, safety is a priority as well. You know, so I, I was like, well, I don't want to have someone come to Thailand and die. Because, you know, and so I, I'll be doing some more events in Thailand, more like paid events, smaller ones. And when you charge people money, you generally have more control of them. For whatever that crazy reason that is, you have more control. People respect the rules more. Yeah, you, paid to be there. you attract a different type of person as well. I mean, you attract more, yeah. Mature, controllable people. So safety is number one. Safety is just number one. And so that's it got too big, got too chaotic. <laughs> Didn't, didn't you get attacked recently or something like you've obviously yeah. you've, you've had so much like 
enemies, I guess, or whatever, online trolls, whatever, over the Stalkers, years. Stalkers, jealous people. I can't talk about, too much about that one. It's the end here. Right, okay. about, oh, I, I guess it's going to court um, and for legal. I can't really get too much into that. Sure. But, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh. I think... I, 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 I think I, I think I'm aware of the name of the guy, but I won't mention it. That's fine. Um, yeah, which was that, but that was um, again just an example of like, you know, some people are obsessed about me. You know, some yeah, people are yeah. obsessed about me. But we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Sure. Um, so what what do you think about like the state of the vegan movement right now as it is online? Uh, I mean, I kind of see maybe I'm wrong about this, but I kind of see that you were a big part in pushing it all online and, and getting people on YouTube and things like that. Um, a lot of people have came after you and, uh, you know, especially a lot of Americans that maybe appeal more to the American audience than you do, I don't know, that kind of were inspired by you. Um, and I think a lot of people, I think you're right in saying there's a lot of people that <clears throat> went on to praise Dr. McDougall, all of those kind of guys. And, and I remember thinking, but they only heard about Dr. McDougall because of Harley. <laughs> like, you used to post his videos as well. And then, uh, so a lot of those people are all like, oh, Harley's wrong, Dr. McDougall, whatever. But what do you think about it now? It seems like, you know, Dr. Gregor's thing, as you were saying, he seems to be really big at the moment. Um, vegan, I mean, plant-based vegan seems to be just really blowing up. Uh, I don't know what's happening in Australia, but over here, as soon as any company launches a vegan product, it's like sold out. Um, my friend's got a restaurant he just started. He says these people are always asking him, do you have a vegan option? Do you have a vegan option? So it seems yeah. like it's really, really blowing up a lot. That's that's really good. I, I'm, and that's the goal. That was always the goal. I was like, you know, and that's, I think that, you know, that was a big part of that. As narcissistic as it might sound, I, I feel that, you know, you know, helping freely lose the weight, and using, you know, weight loss as a massive, you know, hey, look, you can, if you're yeah. a girl, you can get a bikini boy. And that was huge. And sure. I really, you know, a lot of people don't understand the power of weight loss. And I used to do talks about health and stuff. People don't really care too much about it. weight loss is huge. And, I, um, I, I, yeah. it, it kind of blows my mind, especially for women, but for guys as well, like the power of weight loss and the emotion surrounding it is just absolutely crazy. Like I... And I think a lot of women hide that. You know, I think they say, I'm into this for health and spirituality and fitness. And underneath it all, it's like, there's a little girl inside that hates being fat, you know, or, you know, wants to be thin, wants to be loved, wants to be beautiful, whatever it is. And, and that's such a driving emotion. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, like every, which, which is crazy. Because... Th think, think of all the girls that you know I know who have been at Doug Graham's water fast or someone else's water fast. Like, why is a 19 year old girl doing a 30 day water fast? In my <laughs> mind, I'm like, there's only one reason. Like, and and yeah. I spoke I spoke to Doug about this, and he says no one's ever come to my fast to 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 lose weight, just to lose weight. And I'm like, <laughs> really? Like, nine hundred percent of you. Nine hundred percent of you. And and it's always quoted in like it's about spirituality. It's about unpeeling some emotional layer or getting over some trauma but like weight loss as yeah i'm totally I, I totally believe you on that yeah if you want to heal emotional trauma then you know apologize to people you burned you know even if they don't accept your apology ring them up and say hey look i was wrong I'm sorry even if they hang the phone down in your in your head then that that's that's healing like mm. making thing, making amends of the past. You can do all the water fast in the world. If you've been a, a bugger to someone, they're not going to fix that. You, know, you need to yeah. make amends for what you've done. If whether they accept your apology or not, doesn't matter, but you have to have that, that intention of healing past mistakes you've made. Um, whether it's your parents, your ex-boyfriend, your ex-girlfriend or whatever, just like apologizing, and whether or not they accept it or not. It's just your intention is everything. Right? Sure, sure. So, yeah, people would... And weight loss is huge. I really underestimated it, and uh, it's it's crazy. It's crazy that how how powerful this frame and weight loss. But end end of the day, it doesn't matter how you good you look. What matters is who you are inside. Mm. That doesn't mean you have the best physique or whatever. But if you're a, an a hole, you're a, a toxic person. 
who cares really yeah 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 um, so i mean I, i've uh yeah who you are inside is the most important thing your self-respect your self-love your you know, your spirit for community you're helping people your understanding of physiology and i wanted to help people with that that's what matters you know, helping the environment doesn't matter if you're hot or not like who you are inside of what counts but i uh, understand people don't really care about that too much we live in a, such a, a shallow narcissistic world and i prey on people's need like that i prey on you know flex my abs or say look how lean natasha is or whatever mm. because that's the hook to get people in to get them thinking about nutrition and thinking about how they live their lives and thinking about their environmental footprint etc you know, I understand that now, but weight loss, is that's the instant hook. That's the biggest hook because of social approval. Because we think it means something, but it doesn't really mean anything. Yeah. At, at, a, level. yeah. at a spiritual level, weight loss means nothing. Yeah, I mean, you, but still, like, I, I, I always thought instinctively, like, your message back in the day of, like, no, don't restrict as much as you like, like that kind of thing. I always felt like that was probably as well from your experiences. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but I always thought it was because you knew there were so many anorexic prone people that were coming into raw foods, that were coming towards veganism, and that you were trying to at the outset say, You're not, you don't do that. <laughs> like, don't like cut that out, you know. Um, is that part of it as well? Were you, were you seeing like that kind of anorexia mindset a lot of the time? Yeah, it's, it's both like, you know, when you're anorexic, from what I've seen with people, you, you don't feel good. You don't feel good. All the, the smiles yeah. are forced, the, that, the, yeah, the caffeine absolutely. is keeping you absolutely. away. You're not happy. And so I'm always performance driven. You know, performance is health. And if you don't have performance, you don't have health. Let me ask you, have, you, you, ever, just, have you ever met an anor and someone that has clearly got some kind of eating disorder and to your face, they will just not admit it. Like they will just say they eat lots. Have you ever had that experience? Because I, I feel like I've had that experience. With oh, people. Like, like they're, they're so oh, underweight and they're saying like, I eat so much. This is just how I am. This is just my metabolism. I'm like, and, and they're so convincing for a moment. I'm like, really? <laughs> and, and I go, wait, no, that can't be right. Because yeah. they've lied to their parents. You know, right. When you lie to your parents at a deep level, you can lie to anyone because right. you live with your parents. So. Yeah, they, they, they lie. And that's, they lie because they're scared of people finding out they're not perfect. You know, we lie because we're scared of people punishing us for being honest. That's crazy, man. That's a, such a powerful comment. They lie because they're scared that people find out they're not perfect. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> because, yeah. you know, this, this, is, this is my coming back to human, studying human behavior. You know, we lie to people so they find out we're not perfect because we're, we're feeling that they find out we're not perfect it's all these guys taking steroids and stuff and looking all jacked and shredded and ascetic and they will lie about this taking the steroids even though they're clearly abusing the steroids or the girls getting surgery or whatever and i'm not doing surgery no no because they're scared of that criticism oh but you've done surgery oh but you do steroids they're scared of people finding out they're not perfect because they've got, there's such an insecurity level you know from from childhood but being rejected by their mom or their dad or their school teacher they looked up to you know you're not good enough and that that rejection really hurts and so they never want to feel that ever again so these people strive they have anorexia or drug mm -hmm. issues or, or whatever you know it's attachment to fame because they, they they have to have validation because that hurts so much when they were five years old and they presented this, the class the school you know the, to the school captain or whatever the, the, the presentation they did or their school project and someone laughed at them and said, that's the dumbest thing ever. You're stupid. And that just cut deep into them. They never want to feel that ever again. So they're just always trying to impress and get validation for that. Mm -hmm. And so we can make fun of narcissists and whatever, but at a deep level, you know, there's, there's a reason people do that. And so that's what it's all yeah. about understanding that. And once you get enough carbohydrates in, you, you just start to shift in your head a bit. You, you're less attached to what people think about you still yeah. hair. And the reason why we do care about what people think about us is because we're pack animals. We, we came from the jungle where if you get kicked yeah. out of the pack, you're, you're tiger food in yeah. a few hours. Mm -hmm. And so we, we want to be with the pack because the pack is safety. It's like a bunch of sardines. The sardine that's out of the school is tuna food. So we, we, we're just attached to people's opinions so strongly. Yeah. But hey, it's 2020. People can hate us. It doesn't matter because we're not in the jungle anymore. We want to <laughs> eat by tiger. 
Yeah. So if people hate you, it doesn't matter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's okay to be rejected. It's okay to be hated, especially by people who don't even like themselves. Yeah. Let's, let, let me go back um, to the ex-vegan thing. Now, there's a lot of people that, and I want to ask you about this because of your knowledge of the body performance. A lot of these guys are saying, I was vegan, blah, blah, blah. I mean, as far as I remember, they were all saying they were vegan, they were doing phenomenal, right? And then all of a sudden, their story is their health was falling apart and vegan. <laughs> they eat one piece of fish. Overnight, next morning, <laughs> The lights could come on, right? What what is that experience they're having? You think that yeah, that's just total. Because you look at their fate, like look at let's use um let's use Bonnie Rebecca as an example. And not to hate on Bonnie, no hate to her. Just using her as an example. When she was following my advice, she was glowing. Mm -hmm. you know? She was glowing, and uh, and now if you look at her, the glow is, in my opinion, has gone a lot. She had this glow, and so did her boyfriend at the time, Tim. They were like during a lot of fangirls and fanboys of the highest order they were glowing they looked amazing had energy and and relative to now where tim is just he doesn't even want to show himself on camera and bonnie as well it's just like you know high on the makeup just, just mm -hmm. trying to create a bit of that youthful glow she used to have and so you can't deny that when you have glow on your face that's something good going on there you know mm -hmm. you, you, you can't fake glow and Especially middle of the day when your your blood's pumped and you've got some lymph going on, you know. Maybe when you wake up first thing in the morning, you're looking all you know bedhead. I just got out of bed before, so I'm probably looking a bit haggard. But there's this glow you have when you're when you're healthy, yeah. And uh, and you're having good sex or whatever. It's just you're know, getting the carbs in. You get a bit early. This is glow you have, and so yeah. Then people people say I had a bit of fish and my life changed. And it's like well, you eating fish beforehand. <laughs> and, you, and, the, and you did a testimony oh my god during the advice is so good you know i feel so amazing and then doing that video and then make another video oh i'm eating fish now i feel so amazing it's like well your performance doesn't indicate that your glow doesn't indicate that this is just more of a, a clickbait video to try and get some significance or attention which is understandable if you're a youtuber sure. Sure. So, yeah. If, yeah if fish was a performance food you know it's uh I would still be eating it. I was, I was wondering if it was kind of like what you were saying before, if it somehow stimulated, you know, adrenaline or anything like that, or do you mm. think it was... I think you have a, a, a can of fish, like... I, I stopped eating fish, you know, one, because of the environmental issues. But yeah. I'm like, well, I could still eat fish ethically. I could go to the pet shop in the morning and buy all the goldfish that died overnight. You know, mm -hmm. the goldfish, just they live their existence. I could do that. I could go to the beach and find dead fish on the on the water and eat them. So you can definitely get fish ethically. Uh, you get fish from the bin. You get fish from the bin that's been thrown out. That's totally fine, but they just have to throw it out because it's over twenty four hours old. So you could get you can definitely get fish ethically, um, and eat it ethically and karmically. But it's not a performance food. There's nothing in fish right. that your body needs. And yeah. you get a little adrenaline from the fish. Eh, that that wouldn't be much. So yeah, yeah. right, it's, right. It's, placebo it's purely placebo the time, I, gave friend, I gave my friend an acid trip one time it was fake acid trip it's back in 1992 and we, we got a piece of paper me and a few mates we drew i drew a little mushroom or whatever it was or purple oh that's what it was and we gave it to our friends just acid trip and uh he, he tore it in half took half of it and he was like tripping out you know <laughs> like it was just a piece of paper <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he was generally tripping he generally believed it was an acid trip and so the placebo effect is huge. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, talking about performance, you controversially kind of talked about experiments with, experiments with test uh, steroids. What, yeah. what, what things have you tried? Are, do you still do any of them? Like what's, what's happening with you with that? Yeah, just personal curiosity. Uh, in 2000, I read a book out of a friend called Jade and he loaned me a book called Positive which was written by Werner Reiterer. And Werner Reiterer was Australia's best ever track and field athlete. He was a discus thrower. And he was just a natural freak. Right. And he was, he was setting some really good records naturally. But at big competition meets, he was getting smashed by the, the guys who were on the drugs. And uh, before Sydney Olympics, he's like, you know, stuff it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on the program. 
and he got on the got on the steroids and all that. And he was you know, he was set to win gold at City Olympics. And I think I remember the story correctly. He, he just felt so bad about it, just being another fake natty, and being an Australian icon, gold medalist on drugs. He just he pulled the pin, and he mm. wrote his book. Wow. And so, but he weren't his story in the book. It, it would have every man out there who read the book who's an athlete at the time would have been like, oh, what does it feel like to be on steroids? You know, and with the whole Lance Armstrong thing and. Just my personal curiosity got better of me. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get some steroids from the doctors, some testosterone, and I'm gonna take that. And how does it feel? And uh, me being mindful of how powerful these steroids are, whether you're taking the contraceptive pill, if you take it along in a few weeks, you shut down your natural production. You know, so if you're on the pill, then you stop ovulating. If you're on testosterone, then your balls stop working in terms of producing your own testosterone. Right, yeah. So I've never taken it consistently longer than four or five weeks, five weeks, I'd say. And so I've taken it on and off here and there, just a different compound comes in, I might try that. But it's, you know, the amounts I've used have been very small. As you can tell that my physique's still pretty skinny. My voice did change though. I put on a little bit more muscle. Your, muscle your, hit, your, hit. your voice changes on, on, on steroids? Permanently. Really? Permanently. If you take testosterone, I would say for four weeks, 250 milligrams a week, which is very low dosage, which is a, Hormone replacement dosage, just aka TRT, 250 milligram a week is, is not much. It's enough though to create permanent changes in your voice. It was for me. Um, I've taken other compounds as well, anabolics, but again, small amounts, short term, you know, a bit like, you know, I don't know, I don't want to totally change my physique. I don't want to totally. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, 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 my running uh, physique. So I've always dabbled here and there. The one thing I'd say is your shoulders look a lot bigger than back. Like this whole area for you looks bigger than it was back in the day. And I don't know if that's steroids. Yeah. You think? Steroids. Like, like permanent change. Also, I'm not. I'm also not doing as much cycling as I used to do. Right, right, right. Um, that's a factor as well. But the most, the biggest factor is is anabolic steroid usage. It just it, it changes your body permanently. Yeah. Really, permanently. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm still doing weights here and there as well. It, it definitely changes um, yeah. at some so, level, especially if you're really skinny like yeah. I used to be. It, it you know it changes. It, let's say I was naturally this big. Yeah, yeah. Then you won't notice that much of a change. But if you're really skinny like I used to always be, and you take steroids, it's undeniable. You know, it's undeniable. You, right. you just, it changes you permanently. You, you basically hit maturity. You lose your boyishness and. You know, I've got hair on my chest now that I never used to have. So it, it changes you, even just small dose here and there. Jesus. I, I, I I've, I've, used the, um, I've used different compounds, but I've, ne I've never actually done a proper steroid cycle, which would consist of maybe 500 milligrams a week for you know, 10 weeks. If I did that, then, yeah, you'd, you'd see noticeable differences. Given, differences. given that, like, this is a bit totally out there, totally out there but... What do you think about the whole, with how powerful those things are, what do you think about like the movement, the transgender thing and all that, whether we're like sometimes maybe some people are advocating for kids being put on these kind of hormones and things like that, basically for life. And like, uh, I don't know, I, I kind of just, just from hearing your information, I'd kind of like to hear some of your take on that, if you've got any opinion on it. Yeah, like, what do you mean like, uh like what's the specific question is it dangerous like is it bad for people's health basically i think steroids are, the, the contraceptive pill is definitely more dangerous than anabolic steroids like the, the amount of steroids some of these bodybuilders take on youtube except instagram they're, they're taking a lot they're taking like a gram a week every week for like a whole year plus other compounds like d and anadrol and trenbolone acetate Right. They're, they're, they're abusing steroids, but we don't see people dropping dead in the gym from steroid abuse. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Steroids, steroids, I would say the danger of steroids is the mind, how it can change your brain. If you're a fragile person or an aggressive person and you do steroids, that can make you more fragile and more aggressive. So myself, I'm pretty grounded and I feel, I feel if I did become a full-on fake natty, I could, I could handle that. But if you're a person with you know, mental health issues, emotional issues, and you start taking you know, decent amounts, 
then when you come off of that, that can really hit you very hard. So I think that there needs to be more emotional screening for, for mm. guys, especially young kids out there. They're 18, they're 19, they're hopping on steroids, they're hopping on a contraceptive pill. Their brains aren't fully formed. Yet. They don't have that adult executive function and they're just taking this contraceptive pill every day. They're shutting down their ovulation cycle or they're injecting testosterone. They're shutting down their balls cycle and their, you know, their, their hypothalamus, pituitary, gonadal axis, the HPG. They're shutting that down and that, that can cause emotional issues once you get off or you know, various times where they're doing carb restriction and taking clenbuterol and, and these things are powerful drugs that can really cook your head. So we're seeing suicides. We're seeing that. We're not seeing overdose. You can't overdose on steroids. You know, you could take well, too many yeah. Adderall and have liver toxicity, but you won't die from that. Well, I've always thought I've always thought that the bodybuilders died young because of the bodybuilder diet. Nothing to do with the steroids. <laughs> like, eight yeah, eggs, I mean, the thing so breakfast and yeah, it's yeah. all that blood pressure. The blood pressure. You know, it's we do see suicides. We also see recreational drug abuse and cocaine. And, and then they dehydrate themselves in the sauna. So the blood pressure is like, mm. they're red, the neck is so red. <laughs> so blood pressure, is a heart attack can kill them, but it's not the steroids as much as the, the diet and the excess of party drugs and stuff like that, the blood pressure non-regulation. So the steroids aren't the, aren't the cause of that. They're a bit of correlation there, but I wouldn't say it's causation. But in terms of answering your question on giving kids who want to, change genders steroids yeah that's uh that's that, that's a tricky that's a dangerous slope i think I, I don't think people should take steroids unless they have a real medical need for it um it's you know it's uh because once you let's say you, you have an ovarian issue you don't produce enough estrogen okay then there's a place for you let's say you had a testicular issue and you don't produce enough testosterone okay there's a place for testosterone for you but if you've got a perfectly functioning endocrine system and you're introducing these powerful compounds that changes your head, you mm -hmm. know, and yeah. that could be a good or a bad thing. So I think we should have more screening. What sort of person? I, I had a friend who used steroids and he committed suicide um, right. last year. So it's, you know, and he's not a guy who should have taken steroids, you know? Um, so it, it, it has to be more screening, but that's not going to happen because we live in a chaotic world where everyone's just so busy and it's, it's crazy. Like we've got the Harvey Weinstein thing going down, on sure. down now. Sure. I mean, Harvey Weinstein, he's just this Hollywood dude who's banged all these starlets and they're coming out saying, oh, you know, he raped me. And it's like, well, he made you a millionaire. He made you famous. <laughs> and the sex was, you probably didn't like it and now you regret it. But was it really rape? Did the jury convict you because of social pressure? I mean, it wasn't a knife point rape in the, you know, it wasn't, a, in my opinion, like a full on real one. But what we do see is we see genuine rapes of kids out there forcing the prostitution, the yeah. kidnap or human trafficked, and there's no voice for them. We have Rose McGowan in UK saying, hey, I'm a survivor, me too. And it's like, no, you're not. You're a famous celebrity because of Harvey Weinstein. You know what I mean? You're, you're nothing without Harvey. And you had an unfortunate situation with him, but I was, this wasn't too bad. He made you a millionaire. It's so what funny. I was, yeah, I was thinking about that Harvey Weinstein thing. Yeah, sorry. I was thinking about that Harvey Weinstein thing. It's kind of weird that you know, and, and there's memes that go up online of a lot of the people that came out against them and then there's a picture of them with them, like hugging them and kissing them and all this stuff back in the day. And and even if he was raping people or whatever, I just find it weird that they were all protecting him. Like, why why were they protecting him? If he was doing that, why did they not do something? like? I, and, you know, I don't know this whole situation, but... Yeah, but here's the thing, like, how, how is Harvey going to rape anyone? Dude's got no fitness. <laughs> it's like, you know, like, how do you undress someone? And, like, it just, like, it doesn't happen like that. Like, it just can't happen like that. What What's happened, in my opinion, is these girls, you know, they, 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 they regretted it. And that he made them, he, Harvey was a father figure for these women out there who wanted significance, who had massive insecurity. I mean, look at Rose, how much surgery's done on her face. She doesn't accept herself. And so Harvey Weinstein was this father figure for her who made her famous, who made her very, very rich. He probably treated her like junk and she felt rejected from that. So mm. she wanted to say, okay, you hurt me. I'm going to hurt you back. How can I do that? I'm going to destroy your reputation. I'm going to call you a rapist, you know? And that's what happens. We have these like 
these women out there who were nuts and damaged and they claimed fake rape. Yeah. You know, when there was, it was maybe it was a bit like gray area, but it wasn't like, you know, night it's, point, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know? it's, it's, uh, and I think it's funny, like, if you have a jury of the average man, they would probably be looking at it, looking at Harvey Weinstein going, he must have raped them. There's no way they would have sex with him. But he was like the alpha male of Hollywood. Like, he was the you know the power you know so he he would have banged thousands and thousands of hot young women he, he would have he would have smashed through so many women you know and uh the fact that people say they, you know, like yeah I, I disagree i think uh what he did was wrong some of the things but it's, it's well, there's no context there like mm. that, that that jane mcmahon whatever her name was she had a relationship with harvey afterwards it's okay. like 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 what? How does that work? Right, right, right. Was it no consent? Maybe, I don't know, when no one was there in the bedroom. But the fact that you stayed in a relationship with him afterwards, it's like, come on, like. So, yeah, it's, it's like, like if you slap someone in the street, that's assault. If you slap your husband, that's also technically assault. But women were like, well, he pissed me off. Yeah. And the guys are like, yeah, whatever. It's just, it's just part of the deal. Mm-hmm. But. Mm-hmm. And I don't recommend slapping people. I'm just saying that the context's not there. This Me Too movement, it, it just doesn't have any context there at all. And it's just angry women who obviously have been hurt before by a man using Harvey Weinstein as this outlet for aggression. Meanwhile, the genuine rape victims out there, like these kids who are human, human trafficked in the US, in Australia, wherever, there's no voice for them. You know? Right. It's crazy. The voice for the Me Too movement is Rose McGowan, who was made famous and very, very rich because of Harvey's connection. Mm. And nothing really bad that even happened to her with Harvey. You know, it's like in yeah, context, yeah. what's going on with these kids. And so it's just like, come on, you know, just a, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, um, I think we've gone a long time, but there's, there's one last thing I want to go into a little bit. You know, there was some sad news not that long ago, Dr. Robert Lockhart, um, who was an inspiration to me, a friend, I think a genuinely nice guy and um, had, had some good information as well. Very committed yep. to his health um, and unfortunately passed away. Can you, from your perspective, what happened there? That was, uh, I was the first person to put it on social media that Rob had unfortunately passed away and people said, why'd you do that? I want to do that to, to show the warnings of how dangerous dry fasting is. Dry fasting is extreme dehydration. Um, I've got mutual friends of Rob and uh, from Queen here in Australia, we've been inside circle here. So it's like, you know, Rob had massive kidney damage from past dry fasting experience. He had scar in his kidneys. Every time you dry fast, you damage your kidneys, you cause you know, kidney damage, mm-hmm. kidney disease. And so every dry fast builds on the other dry fast of scarring your kidneys. So your renal function goes down every time you dry fast, you get severely dehydrated. So Rob's kidneys were massively impaired from this belief that dry fasting is good. And I, it's just, I believe that Rob, from knowing him for the last 11 years in person, that he had a severe eating disorder and couldn't see, you know, basically he was going into the abyss of insanity. And I remember last time I saw him was in, was in the Philippines and he didn't really want to talk to me. He's like, hey, Harley, and he just, he kept on moving. You know, because yeah. well, every time I met Rob, I'd always tell him my truth. I'd always say, dude, look after yourself, man, you're on the wrong path there. You know, I wasn't, I'm not afraid to tell someone I really feel whether they like it or not. Cause I'm not here to make people feel good. I'm here to people tell people what they need to hear. Mm. And, uh, that I, makes I, you feel good or not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got memories of being at Woodstock and Robert's given a talk and you're there, like, just ask, like, ask, you're like asking him questions or you're having a conversation about like the best places to have fruit and stuff like that. So it's, you know, I, I, I can see that you guys go went quite far back there and everything. And I, I I mean, I never heard of dry fasting, I think, apart from you saying that you knew someone previously that died from dry fasting as well. Um, and, and water fasting, yeah. Right. It's, uh, yeah, my friend V, she was doing a water fast. I've got an itchy nose because it's cat fur. Um, <laughs> but it's because you're a vegan. My cat allergy's got better though. But uh, <laughs> my friend V in 2009, uh, she was, me and Freddie were living with her as a, as a, in a share house she had, and uh, she passed away. 
she was doing water fast and that turned into a dry fast and then her kidney shut down she ended up in a coma and passed away unfortunately so that's 2009 so 2009 I lost my dad I lost friend V so I became like using my platform as warnings like don't don't yeah. do this yeah, water yeah, fasting yeah. dry fasting what are you doing you know and um and it went from there so yeah just basically Rob died his heart failed because when when your kidneys fail your potassium sodium levels get out of whack and then your heart can no longer contract and then you you uh, you pass away so it's you basically have organ shut down and uh with where the kidneys are the priority for everything and once the kidneys go all the organs just start shutting down just switching right. off bang bang right. bang right so that's why it's terrible drink water drink enough water so you pee and clear two or three hours and uh yeah never ever skip water and the people the fruit chairs are like oh, i'll get water for my food for my fruit and it's like well yeah, you, you're gonna have issues with your teeth because your teeth have never got just clean water on them they've always just got mm. sugar on there feeding mm. bacteria and there's nothing rinsing those <laughs> teeth so mm. that's why a lot of fruit chairs have dental issues real quick one because they get a very dry mouth you know, i'm sipping water as we're talking here yeah and because saliva protects teeth and then two if you've got sugar on your teeth or food on your teeth was whatever it is, it's still food for bacteria, which can cause the issues. So another thing with teeth is people can use betadine, iodine, which is called povidine iodine. You can put a bit of betadine on your teeth every month or so. Don't swallow it, spit it, but just put a bit of betadine on your teeth that can really help your teeth, your dental health sure. by killing any bacteria that may be in your mouth that shouldn't really be there as much. Sure. So betadine, Google it up. <laughs> Google well, it that's, up. that's great, man. You, you've given so much today in this interview um I've, uh, yeah i've really i've really enjoyed it um and i, I i'm sure there's more uh, maybe we can have another uh, conversation another time some point in the future I, i'd like to uh, go go into more stuff but that's been really a whirlwind uh, tour of your career everything you've done really uh, or, or not that's not even a fraction to be honest I'm, uh, every, every, every time you say something i think about something else someone else you had some drama with or some issue with or whatever. But um, what, what do you see yourself doing next? What are you up to at the moment? Um, what are your plans, dreams? Uh, and obviously, uh, probably a lot of people know who you are, where you are, but how can people find out more about you if they want to, if they've never heard of you? So, um, you need to go on to just Google up Drew Rider. You know, read some of the hate websites about me, read some of my websites about me. Just, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, what I like about you, Ronnie, is is you're quite honest and open as well and you're a bit of a historian of the movement now because you've you know, you've been around a while and you've you know you you, you watch with passionate eyes and you genuinely want to help people as well and so you're you know, you're passionate about the topic so you're seeing the eyes not from what can i get out of this you're seeing the eyes of like yeah i really enjoy this information and this, this community and and the vegan and the fruit and the thailand and you just enjoy nature and things like that so I can see that you're passionate about this. Yeah, I love, that's, that's what we need. Yeah, we need people love, like you out there. Yeah, I mean, I love the raw food. I, I, yeah, and I do think it's. I do think the raw food movement's been full of a lot of craziness and and weirdness, but it's also been full of a lot of amazing people and beautiful things and inspiration and and like I, part of this podcast, I've I've wanted to try and connect with all these different characters. I'm trying to one by one, you know, all these different people that have played a role and. It's just funny. It's 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 funny to me. I feel kind of fortunate that I came across you, uh, the Woodstock thing, Doug Gray. I mean, to, like, I came across the right information really quick. And I think a lot of people in raw food have come across. Like, I I I'm the kind of person that if, if the first person I came across was a Britannian guy, I might have followed that for a while. You know, I I, I would have because I was so open to try anything out really. Um, but yeah, no, I. Uh, I've I've seen over the years uh, the uh, because I was at the events because I've seen some of that stuff because I followed you from quite far back I I've seen how people have changed you know I've seen how people supported you when it was cool for them to support you and then pulled back when it wasn't and I just don't like that I just think that's something really ungenuine in certain people and uh, I. You know, I, I'm not really the type to kind of go out, expose that or whatever. But but people have done tried to expose you and expose other people. And um, but I I see in you someone 
like you are, you've been doing this, as you say, and before there was money involved, before there was any. Okay, yeah, so just, uh, yeah, thanks for joining, Harley. As you, you were kind of saying, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love the history of it, I don't know why, but I love the whole, uh, and I love finding out, you know, when you were talking about being in California, David Wolf events, that kind of stuff is intriguing to me. I'm like, what were those events all about? And even David Wolf turned up at the Canada Fruit Fest last year. I don't know if you know, like me and Ted Carr worked on this Canada Fruit Fest event and um, and David Wolf randomly kind of showed up. And it was funny because there was all this amazing organic, you know, perfect fruit. And he was like, I'll just have my cocoa beans or whatever. He had some like, <laughs> cacao nibs or something like that you know so it's just Little fact, his cheese and lasagna later on yeah but i just I, like i even respect the fact that he made his uh, contribution whatever and probably probably did have an impact on a lot of people um yeah. but yeah um obviously for people that want to find out more about you check out durian rider online and any last pieces of advice wisdom you've got to share for people just yeah, understand human physiology. I was just on, uh, we had a bit of a tech cut out then and uh, I checked my Instagram account and someone messaged me and I looked at this, so there's this uh, ultra runner called Zach Bitter and he's on the Joe Rogan podcast. And hmm. he, people, people put him up as the keto. He runs in ketosis, people say, he does. But so Zach uh, put up a post where he's drinking these sugar gels and uh, you know, there's people in the comments section going, oh yeah, since, since I added sugar to my diet, I'm, I can run better. And I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but people still use Zach Bitter as this example of a ketosis runner right. when he's actually throwing pictures in and saying, hey guys, I do eat sugar. You know what I mean? Yeah, that yeah, would yeah. be like a vegan bodybuilder. People say, hey look, he's a vegan bodybuilder. And he's like, well, I do eat meat. I mean, big juice <laughs> steak. Like, like, imagine Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan would run with that. He'd be like, hey, look at this, this vegan bodybuilder in steak. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. And Joe Rogan is this guy's like Zach Bitter to push the low carb agenda when Zach is consuming refined sugar. So it's like, I know people that understand my take home message is to people understand human physiology. You need carbs yeah. and you can try and fight that and deny that, but Mother Nature will always win and you'll destroy your fitness, you'll destroy your health and your mental sanity trying to restrict your carbs, be it your fruit or your rice or your sugar. And uh, I'll tell people, yeah, have fruit for breakfast, fruit for lunch, and have your, have your rice meal if you want that. And uh, if you can get enough calories from fruit, then do that. If you can't, put some sugar in there uh, and get some rice in there. Don't feel good about that. Just always focus on performance and your energy of how can you help people around you. And when you are hungry, sure. you get hangry eventually, and your mood drops and your function drops and your hormones start going yeah. down and stuff like that. So and yeah, just look up at some people. Yeah. But something I've got picked up from you as well is, is this idea of community and I think that's something that can really inspire people and community for me is something that is not just essential for spreading you know the information about the vegan movement or whatever but it's essential for people's health to have support of people around them positive people around them and as you're saying in today's world people are living more and more isolated a lot online um, and all that kind of stuff and uh, and I just, I love the fact that you're, you've always been about community, bringing people together. And, um, and, and, and I, I honestly think you've had a massive, massive impact on, uh, on, on the fact that right now there's so much uh, vegan options now, so many plant-based. I, I really do think you did have, a, I think you're right about that, that you did have an impact in, uh, with, with the fact that you took advantage of what YouTube was at that time. So thanks, Harley. We'd love to speak to you again uh, in the future and look forward to seeing what you're doing next. And uh, everyone, just thank you for listening. Whatever you're listening or watching this, feel free to share it, post it. Um, if you want to repost it, put it on your own channel, do what you like with it and uh, rate it, comment on it. And we'll see you in the next interview. If you want to learn more about uh, the raw vegan side of things, the fruit festival, stuff then there's also the fruit festival in the uk uk fruit fest that we run and you can learn more about that at fruitfest.co.uk thanks a lot harley and we'll see you hopefully in another interview and uh, uh thanks for listening everyone we'll see you in the next episode of the love fruit podcast sweet man thank you